sacrificing, humbling ourselves. And louder than the words we say, may true religion lead the way as we, your people, turn and pray and seek your name.
Morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Let's see, Luis, where are you? Can you turn my fan off again, please? Before John gets there? There you go. All right. Good morning. Such. I bonded. It took a while. I finally bonded this morning. <laughs> took a bit. All right. Well, find your way in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, or as I like to affectionately call it, do no wrong to me, chapter 19. Um, and as you're turning there, a couple things for you. Uh, this coming Saturday is our uh, second outreach of the summer to the cities of North Dakota to preach the gospel unto uh, those that live there. We are going to um, Jamestown. That's in North Dakota, right? The people in Minnesota, somebody else has got to preach the gospel to them. We're, we're going the other way. Uh, mm -hmm. Jamestown on Saturday the 23rd. And for those of you who are not aware, uh, that means that you probably are not on the email list, or I may have missed you, or, or sometimes your husband gets the email and then you do not. Is that what happened? Did you get it? You got it. All right, very good. Um, we are going to be in Jamestown on Saturday the 23rd to preach the gospel. Uh, we're, pre we're preaching repentance love and repentance unto the believing of Jesus Christ that the city would turn and that it happens uh, beginning really uh, on the day. Uh, the parade starts at 9.30 a.m., right? So now, as I say that, that's the time the parade starts. If you show up at 9.30, the parade will have passed you by, okay? We are in the parade, that's why I say that. If you wanna just come watch the parade, that's great. And you wanna then pick up as we pass by and join in, uh, we are going to be handing out cards, uh, and then uh, waters, candy. I think candy is gonna be thrown. This time, don't throw the candy at the people. Throw the candy on the ground in front of the people. We had a few people get pelted last uh, parade we did with candy, and uh, I should have been prepared. That could have been my prop. I could have threw candy out at you, what not to do, and then if you got pelted, I'd say, I just, I, I'm just doing what I've seen, you know. So we're going to preach Christ, uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that is also going to be uh, followed up with, we have a, we have a, a booth in McElroy Park, uh, a vendor booth in which we will be preaching the gospel. Now, if, you have, if you're going with your family, your children, there is an inflatable park there where your kids can bounce all day long if you want and interact with all the other children. We do plan to from our vendor booth, share the gospel. That's a place you can come back to, get supplies, go out. Uh, great opportunity. We'll all have shirts again, like we did in Valley City. Uh, then on the front, it will say, Jesus loves Jamestown. On the back, Jesus saves. And that's uh, they're green this year. So if you show up in your red Valley City shirt, you will be, um, I don't know, see what it, yeah, we'll make fun of you. Uh, <laughs> in love, that's how you'll know you're really loved. Um, so if you do show up with a red shirt, we'll give you a green one to put over top. And uh, Lord bless you on that. So we do meet. What is the time frame you meet? If you are involved with the decorating of the float, 8 a.m. is when you need to be there. We will decorate in line. This is an open registration, meaning there is no registration for the parade. And so we will decorate the float and set up for worship while we're in line. And we'll line up again, beginning at McElroy Park. I think it's First Avenue South, uh, the parade route. So all that information is on our website with a link. You can look at the map, how to get to Jamestown. Jamestown is, if you drive legally, and uh, my speeder is not in the room, so I can't make fun of him. Uh, it takes about an hour and 20 minutes to get to Jamestown. And unless you stop for pie at Tower City, then it takes a lot longer uh, to get there. Um, but I encourage you to be a part of this. Uh, I would, again, love our church to come out and, and to have as many as possible walk the parade route and share the love uh, and really the idea of repentance concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to go and do. So uh, enough for that. That's on our website. You can look at the church calendar for all the other events. 
And then if you do want to be emailed, please let me know if you're not receiving emails on the church email list. So Deuteronomy 19, as you found your way there, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we thank you today. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, we ask today that your spirit would teach us and give us a greater uh, wisdom and understanding concerning the knowledge of the Son of God, who you are, how you've come, your death, resurrection, your power. Lord, your power over death, your power of life that you grant unto those who come to faith in you. Lord, we trust you. We ask today that your spirit would teach and impart to us uh, the life of Jesus Christ continuing in you. In this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So in your Bible, uh, we get back to the study of uh, Deborim, the words that God spoke uh, unto Moses to say unto the children of Israel immediately before they go into the promised land. Uh, in Hebrew, it's uh, Deborim. So that's where uh, the, out of the Latin into the English, Deuteronomy, second law or second words, Yes, there's a lot of repetition, but we've covered this study already in, in Deuteronomy 35 concerning the cities of refuge that were to be set aside. And in Deuteronomy 4, for, this, for the other side of the Jordan where the two and a half tribes stayed, they already set up the cities. Moses is going to talk about it today. And then in Joshua chapter 20, when they actually get into the promised land, you get the record they, they set them up. Now, so, so there is repetition. And that's where we want to pay attention to the teaching of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God in the context of which it was given. Now, I remind you in this way that uh, the children of Israel are going to go into the promised land. And they've been seemingly on delay, but uh, time in the wilderness is not delay. It's very intent, uh, intentful and purposeful with God to, to perfect the saints, if you will, in this case Israel, concerning their hard hearts and their rebellion to simply listen to what God had said to them. Now, we come to this place today and looking out, uh, we're not going to go back to, uh, to wilderness living. We're not going to figure out how we too can you know, somehow get manna from heaven and water from a rock. No, all those things that happened unto them were written for our learning. And catch this phrase, upon whom the end of the age has come. That was the question that the disciples posed to Jesus. When, when's your coming? All right, what's the sign of your coming and when's the end of the age? Well, as we understand this, the end of the age of what we're looking for is the end of the kingdom of man and the beginning of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's the next age, the kingdom age. We're waiting for Jesus to come and set up his kingdom. In his first coming, he accomplished through the cross the salvation for all of mankind, meaning that his blood sacrifice is sufficient as savior of the world. That that blood price to pay for all the judgment of God upon sin. What a sacrifice. But it applies only in those who come to faith in him, who believe and receive. We're in this study today, looking out in the world, waiting for Jesus to come, and all the signs that he gave us of just how bad things would be before he came, right? How bad things would be spiritually. How, how it would be a repetition of the days of Noah when the Bible records and gives witness to the condition of mankind that it was in men's hearts to do evil continually and that's when god judged the world with a flood we have the promise from god again that that wonderful rainbow promise that's been hijacked i, I might uh, make a side note but it's not hijacked for us uh, that that rainbow in the cloud still gives a witness and maybe that's where things went wrong is when we removed it out of the cloud you, you took it from that which was from heaven and brought it down to earth in the wisdom of man and said well we'll We'll claim our own promises and make our own way. Now, as I impart to you, uh, looking out at the world, and the way I want to bring this today, concerning the study in Deuteronomy 19, children of Israel are going into the promised land, in much the same way we have an anticipation right now for the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. Right, you, you are, uh, again, if you, if you catch this and, and you believe this to be true in Jesus Christ, that he's returning and he will rule and reign uh, on this earth for a thousand years. And, and this view of, of, of him coming into the world and we're looking out at the world at all the perilous times and, and the signs of false Christs, you know, many, many claiming to be Jesus and, and trouble in the world. Well, well, what's the problem, right? Well, the problem is sin. That's what we come to. The problem is sin. 
Why is the world falling apart because of the, the sin of mankind? The world itself, the actual terra, you know, terra firma of the world, it, it's not moving. I mean, man, man is saying all these things are happening, but it's mankind through the sin and the corruption that's in the world through lust, as Peter tells us, and, and the problem is sin. Well, how bad is it? Is that what you want to know? Here's how the Bible declares the problem is sin. This is Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12. Go ahead and turn there. I'll, I'll give you some time. I'll get my first sanctioned pastor coffee break as you turn to Romans 5.12. Now, as we look upon the world waiting for Jesus Christ to return, I remind you, don't fall for a false teacher right now. Right? False teachers who say that sin really isn't sin anymore. Or a false teacher that says something like, Jesus can't come back until we, until we take over the seven mountains of the earth. And they somehow have figured out how to label them. I remind you that, that it's actually the Antichrist who rules of the city over the seven mountains. And I, I, I'm not interested in any seven mountains or anything that we as the church need to do before Jesus comes back. He doesn't need our help to come back. He'll come back right on time. Okay. Now, as I say this, Romans 5.12, the problem is sin. It was, it was then in Deuteronomy 19, it is today, and it will be tomorrow, unless the Lord comes and returns and starts to set everything right. The Bible declares in Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. We're going to look at, in chapter 19 of Deuteronomy, the, the effect of that truth that sin entered into the world, that by the actions of another, one would be killed and, and would die. And what's the consequence? And, well, how bad is it? If you're in Romans 5.12, just a couple pages to the right, go to 7.13. So from Romans 5.12 to Romans 7.13. So don't be surprised when people die. I'm, I'm still amazed at how the world, the world will kill people that nobody seems to know about yet in the womb, thinking that it's no problem. And then they'll, they'll weep and mourn and be so surprised that somebody who was alive, that, that they would actually die. And uh, one commercial on TV says, you can't live forever, but, but you can try. I was like, well, I am going to live forever. And it's not through my effort. I mean, you, you see the things that the world has just gone mad. How bad is it? Well, Romans 7, 13, Paul describes that he found out that this nature, that not only what had happened in the world, that all, would, that all have sinned and all would die, he realized within, there's some problems. He says, was then that which was good made death unto me? So he's talking about the law, how it revealed, right, and the goodness of God that if you keep the law, it'll go well with you. And what Paul discover? He couldn't keep the law. Even though he wanted to do it, he keep, couldn't keep the law of God. He says, but sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. I, people get all tangled up today, and so they, they want to blur those lines of good and evil, and, and this is good, this is bad. And maybe if we just, you know, if we, if we simply don't call anything any more bad, everything will be good. Pretty basic philosophy that the world's operating under right now. And with fervor to say that nothing is sin anymore. In fact, let's not even use that word. But Paul describes that sin by the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Well, in a study like this, uh, Deuteronomy 19, let, let's take a look at verses 1 through 7. It says, When the Lord your God has cut off all the nations whose land the Lord your God is giving you, and you dispossess them, and dwell in their cities and in their houses, you shall separate three cities for yourself in the midst of your land, which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. You shall prepare roads for yourself, divide into three parts the territory of your land, which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, that the manslayer may flee there. And this is the case of the manslayer who flees there, that he may live. Whoever kills his neighbor unintentionally not having hated him in time past, as when a man goes to the woods with his neighbor to cut timber, and his hand swings a stroke with the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies. He shall flee to one of these cities and live. Lest the avenger of blood 
while his anger is hot, pursue the manslayer, overtake him, because the way is long, and kill him, though he was not deserving of death, since he had not hated the victim in time past. Therefore I command you, saying, you shall separate three cities for yourself. Like I said, we're not going back to the wilderness days to, you know, manna from heaven, you know, water out of the rock. We're, these are written for our learning. Nor are we going back to the, the days in which the children of Israel were waiting to go into the promised land. Now, there, there's none of this for us to repeat, but if we don't learn from them, again, we will still repeat the same things if we don't take heed unto what we hear and how we hear these things. So what do we learn? We learn that God had provided a place of refuge, cities of refuge. And I remind you, as we look upon this world and the sin that's in the, in the world and the death that comes to all of mankind, you watch what's going on in the world and how bad is it? Well, it's within. And I remind you that it is only Jesus Christ and him who is our hope. Jesus is our refuge. And as you come to this place of, of looking at this today, I remind you, right? And these are words... These are words of Jesus. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. What's destroying men's lives? What's destroying women's lives? What's destroying the world? Sin. Right? Sin. That which, I, I don't know where anybody else will talk about this today. You realize when you remove sin, you also remove the necessity of the cross. And we've been warned. I mean, there have been voices who have said, there is a, a coming world religion that, that will reject the necessity of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. We come to this place, uh, again, of reminding, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He's the refuge. And I, I know of one of the, the Calvary Chapel guys who, who he renamed his entire, uh, just renamed the entire church, the refuge. Right? And he, he gives personal witness and testimony from the pulpit at pastor's conference, how when he was a young man up hiking in the hills with his friends and how he is hiking near the edge and Satan came to him and was tempting him to, to jump off the side of the mountain. Had, had no thoughts of his own that at that point he, he should ever do such a thing, but he said the temptation was real and it was not from him and Satan was tempting him to do that. And and he comes to that place and recognizing the, the trouble that's in the world. And you look at the stats and the problems and the sin that's corrupting the world and how that passes from one person to another. And, and I'm here to remind you today that God has provided in Jesus Christ a refuge. And he's not far away from any one of us. Not far away. Let's learn from the truth in regards to what God gave the children of Israel concerning the cities over things that were going on in their day, and let's learn from this. Jesus, our refuge. So verse one says, the Lord God hath cut off the nations. Don't think for an instant that that's a light matter. The word they're cut off is, is used in the way the grammar is put forth. The way we would say that, we would say that the Lord God would destroy the nations that were in that place that he was going to give to Israel. Cut off, karat. It's the same word prophetically in, in describing, as Daniel prophesies in the, in the 70th week of Daniel, in the 70 weeks prophecy, for those of you who are familiar, how that the Messiah would come and he would be karat. He would be executed. He would be cut off. He would be destroyed, but not for himself. That same word shows up in the same grammar that we would understand. The Lord God is going to destroy the nations that are in that land of Canaan that he's promised to give unto his people Israel. The judgment of God upon the sin of the nations of Canaan. L listen to these words. To destroy those that are under a condemnation because of their sin. Now, you see why this lays before us a, a, almost a parallel as we are waiting for Jesus Christ to return. And the promise is the kingdom of God here on earth where the saints will inherit the kingdom. And in the meantime, you're watching in the world, the nations increase their ungodliness, their unrighteousness. How about this one? The way Romans describes it, suppressing the truth. Su suppressing uh, in unrighteousness the truth that God could be known. And so you see this parallel at work. The judgment of God upon the sin of those nations to destroy them. Even now we understand the righteousness and the coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. 
the way the Bible describes this, there's a wrath to come. There is a wrath to come. So what do we do in, in this understanding that, that even after Jesus has come, died on the cross and resurrected, that in his gospel going forth into the world, that as that gospel is preached, there are many who refuse, right, who refuse to believe, who refuse to repent, won't change their mind, even though the Son of God has come and accomplished the resurrection from the dead. Now, as I share that with you, the forerunner of Jesus by prophecy, John the baptizer, his message was repentance. And then he saw those who, by their outward appearances, by their self-righteousness, declared openly, boldly, and even with words, we do not need to repent. Now again, you catch this as we go out with the gospel. What are you finding as you share the gospel? Well, as our Lord taught us, you scatter the word of God, you find four types of, of hearts to the word of God. Some are hard, some are thorny, some are shallow, some are good. Now, in, in putting this forth, this is Luke 3, 7. Just again, hear John the baptizer's words to the self-righteous, to those who had an outward show only, who were not going to make any changes in their heart. The way I describe it, especially when I've done outreach in Grand Forks many times, a polite hardness. Really nice people, but closed and hard to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? That was his word of repentance. Our promise to those who have believed and received, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who has delivered us from the wrath to come. The wrath to come is not changed by whether you believe or don't believe. But it makes all the difference in the world what it is for you to be saved from wrath or to be delivered over unto it. Now we come to this place that I, I find to be important and I want you to see this one. Find your way to Revelation 11, 18. Now, Revelation 11, as you log that in your mind, you're coming through that, the two witnesses, the rebuilding of the temple. Supernatural time in the future when that temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem. The two witnesses there, again, standing over that and with supernatural powers to protect, uh, again, and they're witnessing the truth of who God is and who the Son of God is. And at the end of that chapter, there's a word of witness to the nations because the Antichrist does take power over them to slay their bodies, but in three and a half days, they have a supernatural rising again in which the whole world sees and they ascend right into heaven, those two witnesses. Super, super, I, I, I don't know what, the whole world's gonna see that. Maybe everybody will be watching from their handheld device or the goggles that people will be wearing in the future, which isn't a future, is it? See? Revelation eleven eighteen. read this with me, you see it. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come. In the revelation of Jesus Christ is the record of the scripture, the witness of what I've been talking about all morning to you. There is a wrath to come, there's a kingdom of Jesus Christ to come, and when Jesus Christ comes to set up his kingdom, it's synonymous with the wrath of God has come. And look at this phrase, the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and thou should... Give, them, give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. And look at this last phrase. And should destroy them which destroy the earth. Now, we've been lied to that mankind is destroying the earth right now by all these false signs or things falsely called science. They're only being used to gather the world together behind a cause that will ultimately usher in the false Christ. But yet the Bible says in the revelation of Jesus Christ that Jesus ultimately will destroy them which are destroying the earth. Again, what destroys the earth? The corruption of the sinfulness of mankind. Now, here we are looking at this in Deuteronomy 19 in that a land that God had promised unto Israel and he's sending them into the land and he gives some specific instruction unto them. So we see that God is going to destroy the earth, but he's going to prepare the earth to be inherited by the saints who believe in God. What, what a wonderful thing we look forward to. I grew up in a church who denied the millennial reign of Christ. So glad I got out of that. They didn't believe the Bible. I didn't know they didn't believe the Bible. Till like, you, well, which parts don't you believe? Well, we'll tell you the parts which came from God and which parts didn't. Like, how, how can you 
endure in a place where somebody else can tell you what God said and what he didn't say. We have the word of God. And it is my plea as we come to this in this land that the Lord God gave Israel. And look at that phrase, that succeeds them. You do understand that God is going to destroy this Christ-rejecting world, the, the unbelievers in it. God's wrath abides upon sin. Because of the, of the sin, the condemnation remains, the wrath remains upon those who reject Jesus Christ. And he's going to give the kingdom to the saints. We're going to succeed them. The word there for succeed is a, is a Hebrew primitive root word, yarash. To occupy by driving out previous tenants, possessing in their place by implication, to seize, to rob, to inherit, to expel, to impoverish, to ruin, cast out, consume, destroy, disinherit, dispossess. And if you've read in Revelation, who does all that? Jesus does. Jesus, our Lord, comes and dispossesses the nations. What happens on that microcosm for Israel entering into the promised land is where we sit today, right, right in the days before the coming of the Son of Man in which we will inherit a kingdom. And it's a kingdom made without hands. It's the end of the kingdom of man. That the kingdom of man will be ground to powder. And, and we come to this place looking at, at this refuge that God had given in the cities and in this truth of the revelation and the coming of Jesus Christ, that he will destroy the nations that have rejected him and he will give his kingdom to the saints. A thousand-year kingdom here, but it's eternal in the new heavens and the new earth. And in that reality, the promise again given unto Israel that they would inherit that land, unto us we would inherit a kingdom. For Gentiles too, right? Those who come to faith in Jesus Christ. So what do we have to learn? Much and in every way. We, we, we talk a lot about the little that we know of what's coming. But the little that we know is the promise and the hope that in Jesus Christ, and my plea to you today is uh, make him your refuge, your trust, your hope. Again, there's a couple of words that, that are in Hebrew that, that get into English, and there's a couple of things that, that, that this fulfills in being a refuge. In this instruction here, again, sin being the problem and, and the death that comes forth, what, what maybe, maybe there isn't a better sin to examine in the context of understanding sin and death than, than, than murder or killing another one. Because it, it's sudden, it ends, it's right there. And, and so you, we, we learn a lot from this. They were told to separate three cities in verse 2, okay, and then to prepare Thou shalt prepare thee away, divide them equally, that every slayer may flee there. I remind you, righteousness exalts a nation. That, that's, that's a truth, right? God is going to destroy those nations that lived in unrighteousness before him. Concerning the guilt of bloodshed, which is what we're talking about in chapter 19, God has previously addressed Moses to tell the children of Israel, Again, chapter 12, same phrase. God is going to destroy those nations. You're going to succeed them. You're going to yarash them, and that's going to be yours. And he is removing them for two reasons. Idolatry and guilt of bloodshed. Now, I, I don't know what your perspective of what's going on in the world is, but I'll tell you mine, because I got the microphone, right? Those are the issues. The, that mankind right now is worshiping anything but the living God. But then there's this people who believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who came 2,000 years ago, died on the cross, rose again, a people who are a minority, a people who hold, a people who believe in the Son of God, and, and, and separated from the world with instruction to follow God no matter what the world will do, and the whole world is going to run after a false Christ when he comes to say he's really someone that he's not. Concerning that guilt of bloodshed, so you got the idolatry, and I see it, I see idolatry and the guilt of bloodshed. I mean, if you could figuratively see the bloodshed of, of the sin of, of killing innocent blood upon the hands of mankind, we would be appalled from God's perspective. We would be saying, Lord, come now. Lord, why hasn't your wrath come already? It's only through Jesus Christ that having made him our refuge that we are cleansed from sin. And this becomes an important part of today's study. Concerning that guilt of bloodshed, the murder of the innocents, I don't even like to talk about the numbers that we've accomplished in this country under law, let alone all the ones, 
Again, the plea bargaining. Do you ever give a plea bargain to one who had murdered? And yet these things happen all the time. Now, as I plea with you to understand that which is coming and what we have today and why we need to, for ourselves, understand these things. He gives commandment under the law for Israel to keep them from sin that destroys. The nations were dispossessed, right, cast out, destroyed, ruined because of their worship of idols and the guilt of bloodshed. Now, as you get that into your, into your heart and your mind, and to think that Israel was then instructed, don't go, don't go the same way. In chapter 12, they're, they're warned against idolatry. In chapter 19, a structure, a refuge to keep them from their hands shedding innocent blood. Separate the three cities. Again, for us, very clear. They are called to not go like the way of the Canaanites who were before them. And they were told to separate three cities in order to make a way that anyone who killed someone could actually flee there. And all I can say is, is it's not of this world. Israel's called to live differently. We who follow Jesus Christ, he's, he said it this way, John 17, 16. They are not of the world. I am not of the world. John 18 he says, if my kingdom were of this world, my followers, my disciples would fight that I would not be delivered and handed over. He says, but now my kingdom is not from here. Now, this whole thing that I, that I present to you today, learning from this, they were told to separate. Okay, you catch that? We are to separate our lives and place them in hope and trust in Jesus Christ. He is our refuge. He's the city. The church isn't the city. I mean, even in this world, people are using the term sanctuary cities. You know what I'm discovering? That sanctuary that the world is offering is an increase of unrighteousness. So they're actually suppressing the truth and saying, come live here, do whatever you want to do. We won't hand you over for sinning. And yet in Jesus, he says, my kingdom is not over. We're not going to win the fight against, against this world in the flesh. And we, we need to understand that this warfare, which is very real, these things that have exalted themselves above the knowledge of God. And that's the power to cast down these strongholds. As you preach Christ, what are we really trying to work for people? We're trying to work repentance, that they would see, that they would hear, that they would know the Son of God. Well, they were told to prepare the way that the slitter may get there. Truly, Jesus is the way. I'm not doing any, you know scriptural gymnastics for you today. We know this. Jesus is the way. Concerning those that have believed upon Jesus and trusted in his salvation, all right, and, and in the early days, they were known as those that followed the way. That was it. Jesus is the way. So the one that was sent before was sent to prepare the way. Jesus is the way. Now we come after saying, Jesus is the way, and let me show you how to follow him. It's that basic. And if we have found the way and we know the way to the refuge, when we in, encounter others in this life who are living in this world as the world is really waiting for wrath to come, they just don't know it. They believe the lie that through some sort of transformation of mankind, they can actually rise above the judgment of God. Well, they don't even pretend that there is a judgment of God anymore. Now we follow after and declare through the gospel of Jesus Christ how the slayer can find the way how the sinner can be saved. This, this is basic and yet powerful. And then we're told, what is our preparation? Ephesians 6, part of our, our armor for warfare like this. Feet shod with keen, said, wait, wait, no, not keen sandals. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, we understand that these teachings that come this way Romans 10, 15 describes, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. That's our preparation. We know the way. We prepare the gospel to go out and declare unto others who are slayers, who are, are going to die if they don't get to the refuge. Basic. But maybe you've never considered and compared, contrasted, spiritual with spiritual, to understand just how much Jesus is the only protection from the judgment that's to come. There is no other way. In verses 4, the instruction was to flee for refuge, that the slayer may flee, that he may live. Now it says in, in, in 4 there, again, ignorantly, when I read it out of the New King James, uh, it said, 
unintentionally. The idea here of the slayer, and then the example is given of two men out chopping wood in, in the forest, axe head falls off, kills the other guy. What a freak accident, we would say, right? But every shedding of blood, every accountability for every action concerning the death of mankind. Now you understand that, and that if, if there wasn't a refuge for that man to flee to, the avenger of blood would pursue the slayer and would, would kill him in revenge for the bloodshed, the bloodshed, and then a man who was not worthy to die because he didn't have hatred. Remember how Jesus taught this? He said, you have heard it said of old that sh thou shalt not murder. And then he goes to the issue of hatred. So now someone who killed without hatred and this, what we now understand, did it ignorantly. Where can the slayer go that he may live for sins of ignorance? Now, what are those sins of ignorance? Well, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, who was instructed to raise up elders and teach and give the doctrine of Christ. You've seen my life. You've heard what I've taught. And he gives specific instruction to Timothy in talking about his former life when he pursued others and killed them. He was a murderer. Paul did it. He thought he was doing a service for God. And how can a man like that, how can he be saved? Well, he fled for the refuge for his soul. He fled to Jesus Christ, met him on the road. Who are you, Lord? And Paul himself found the refuge from the sins that he had done ignorantly. I, I, I think this is the way we are to understand it. And I want you to see it, 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 14. So not just hear me talk about it, but with your own eyes to see and you know why we need this? For the sins we committed before we came to Christ. And for the sins we committed after we came to Christ. Now Paul describes those things that he did before he came to Christ. And he tells Timothy his viewpoint. He says, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, 1 Timothy 1.12. I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who hath enabled me, for he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer, a persecutor an injuria, and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. How many times do you listen to someone who describes their broken life before they ever realized they were guilty of sin themselves and things they had done happened unto them? And then you meet them and through the gospel of Jesus Christ, what are you simply doing? You're preparing the way for them to come to Jesus, our hope and our trust, the way. Through the gospel of Jesus Christ, you provide a refuge. Not that you're the refuge yourself, hardly, but you found the refuge and you know the way to the refuge. And we're now out preaching the gospel saying, come to Jesus. What about these things I've done? You know how many things I've heard from people, they start talking with me and they just, they need to, they need to confess the things that they have done in their lives. And, and they tell me all these things and then I reassure them, that's forgivable. Sins of ignorance. Paul said, I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But don't miss verse 14. He says, and the grace of our Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Jesus Christ. So this sin that is in the world, this, this flesh of all mankind, even those who set about to do good, what, as we preach the gospel, what are, we, what are we saying? We know the way for you to be saved. Flee to Jesus, your refuge. Again, you, you might think that, that it would be far better for you just to like, talk about the love of God with butterflies and rainbows and puppy dogs and kittens and bunnies in heaven forever, and that's, not, that's really not true. The reality is sin and death. The love that God has in sending forth His Son is, is a bloody love. It's not pleasant. And you see why where we're at, because the avenger of blood pursues the slayer. I, sins done in ignorance, if not confessed, if not Jesus isn't received, those sins that are done in ignorance still carry the same penalty of death. And therefore, how important it is for us to be out to, to preach Christ that they might hear and be saved before the avenger of blood comes upon them. I, I used to say it this way, no decision about Jesus Christ is a decision. lest they be overtaken by the avenger. 
And this is the reality of the truth that, that God teaches. And why a city of refuge? Because there is a justice in the vengeance of God upon the sinfulness of mankind and that wages of sin is death. There's a justice there. And, and then I just, I just ask it. So you have, you have Jesus, the Goel, the kinsman redeemer, book of Ruth. We love those Bible studies because she comes to him. She asks for a covering. She realizes she needs to be covered. Her sins need to be forgiven. She wants to worship the living God and her sins are covered. Boaz is a type of Christ. The kinsman redeemer, Jesus, death on the cross, his blood, his redemption. He's our kinsman redeemer. But in his second coming, he's also the same Goel, the same person, is also known as the avenger of blood. The one who would redeem and buy back the land, and in that case, Ruth as a wife. Again, that, that's a great picture of Christ for the Gentile bride, if you will, the church. But then there's this, this other side that the wrath of God abides upon the sinfulness of mankind, and that Jesus, when he returns, is also going to fulfill the vengeance of God upon the sinfulness of mankind. One and the same. How would you like to meet him? Would you like to meet him as kinsman redeemer? Asking for his covering, Lord, forgive my sin. Lord, that's I, I, how I've met him. I know that my sin are forgiven. Why do we fear the Lord? Because he's the only one who can forgive sin. Or do you want to meet him as the avenger of blood? Yeah, I have no time for that God thing. I have no time. That's too much church for me. I've tried that before. Whatever excuses people use. And, 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 and when one stands before him, this will never pass as an excuse when you're before him. I never knew. The witness has gone forth into this world. Now, in 8 through 13, it's, it's an interesting addition to what they've already done. Already have three on the other side. They're told to make three on this side. And he says, When the Lord God enlarge thy coast, as he has sworn unto thy fathers, and give you the land which he promised to give unto your fathers, and you keep the commandments to do them, which I command thee this day, to love the Lord thy God, walk in his ways, thou shalt add three more cities. See, God intends to make that fruitful and have that abound. He desires for that to increase and for that to grow for the children of Israel. These things are to go forth. And then he, he reminds them that as they grow and they increase and they multiply, that they need to add more cities of refuge. And look at verse 10, that the innocent blood be not shed in the land. Hey, I know many people today talk about culture wars, you know, Bible culture, biblical worldview. I simply say unto you, Jesus Christ and his cross and his blood and all the truth in scripture. What's really being rejected is the son of God. You can say biblical worldview and what, I, I, I listen to the same things and look at the same stats and things and they're troubling, but if you come to this, the shedding of innocent blood in the land which the Lord gives thee for inheritance. Right? So the law of the land today is fighting over in it shedding innocent blood legally. Right? You pay attention to what the House passed this week. Right? They want to continue this. They want to kill our babies. They want to kill our future. Do you not see already we're already missing how many people in our, in our, in our society and culture, population? Where, where is everybody? Well, we killed them. The shedding of innocent blood. Same issues as this multiplies. And you say, even the, even the way that the gospel has gone forth into this country, and it still has overtaken this land. The taking heed unto the word in which the children of Israel, to love the Lord, walk in his ways, as you increase, add more refuge. Verse 11, but if any man hate his neighbor, lies in wait for him, rises up against him, smites him mortally that he may die, if he flees to one of these cities, the elders of that city shall send and fetch him and deliver him into the hand of the avenger of blood. It was never to be a place of sanctuary for one who had sinned willfully. Thine eyes shall not pity him. Thou shalt put away the guilt of innocent blood from Israel that it may go well with thee. Now what do we learn today? I, I simply say this, universally speaking. Because what, what are people telling you now? It doesn't matter anymore. Nothing matters anymore. Do what you want to do, however you want to do it. God loves you, go to heaven big party in heaven, whatever lie, and you think of the, the lie of universalism that really says you'll have an opportunity at the end, God will accept everybody, you made no difference what you did, and that completely disagrees with scripture. 
universally speaking, lies that all men are saved. Now here's the truth. It is God's desire and his will that all men would come to repentance and be saved. Yet there are those who delivered to death for all of eternity, contrary to the will of God, contrary to his desires. And don't think for an instant, those that tell you that God chose people to be that way, that it was his will. God's will is that all would be saved. So we preach Christ. A great word for us as believers, as we increase and grow, to keep the commandments of loving the Lord and walking in his ways and holding to the truth and commandments of Jesus Christ, not changing the doctrine of Christ, nor the doctrine of salvation, the need, the necessity for a city of refuge. And I remind you, it is about the blood. It's about the guilt of bloodshed. Right? Book of Hebrews says, Abel's blood cries out, but the blood of Jesus speaks better things than that of Abel. It is about the blood. The blood of Jesus speaks these things that our inheritance is in Jesus Christ because we're bought by his blood, cleansed by his blood, saved by his blood. In other words, he died that we might live. How horrible would it be to forget the death of our Lord Jesus? How horrible would it be to count his sacrifice for sin a common thing and trample the blood of the Son of God underfoot? Sound like a book of Hebrews to you, huh? There's a warning in 14. Thou shalt not remove thy neighbor's landmark, which was set at old time in thy inheritance, which thou shalt inherit the land which the Lord gives thee to possess it. And it reveals the pride of the current generation exalting themselves above the knowledge of God to remove the things that were set in place by others. The landmark, the border, literally a twisted cord. The idea of this was put together so you cannot get this apart, to remove the ancient landmarks, the changing of laws, the re redefinition, the rethinking. I'm here to let you know this is, we're, we're right in the days before the coming of the Son of Man to set up his kingdom. There are those today trying to unwind every cord through every way they can possibly do it, through the law system, through whatever philosophy of man, whatever lie, whatever deception, to unwind the cord, remove the ancient landmarks. I illustrate for you, is a man a man and is a woman a woman? The way God made them in the beginning, made them male and female. That's how he created them. Hey, the young'uns who aren't in the word of God will fall for all the conforming power of the world. And so will the old ones. It's the word of God. It's, it's the testimony of Jesus Christ. That cord is not to be unraveled. It's a twisted cord that God had gave so you would know these things. So in the, if you think about it, redefining, rethinking, or if you will, removing of the boundaries. That one might take what they want for themselves. Isn't that what it is? Why would you remove your neighbor's boundary line? Well, I want his property. I want to encroach in. I, I want something for myself. Let's blur the lines, right? Let's use genetics. To, let's, let's take the genetics of animals and incorporate them into the genetics of, of mankind. See, that's all removing of the boundaries that one might take what they want for themselves. It's no different than Ahab wanting Naboth's vineyard and whining and complaining and taking counsel from his wife Jezebel how to steal from Naboth, removing the ancient boundaries. Through a false witness, I might add, the church of Thyatira under the teachings of Jezebel, that sexual immorality that taught and practiced is okay for the church. Again, the, it's a false witness, isn't it? That there would be a whole people that call them church and have actually said we can kill babies. They're, fa they're, false, they're false shepherds. That's false. Or that, or, that, or that human sexuality, it can be redefined. That's a false, that's a false prophet who says something like that. Jesus called upon his church to repent of this practice, the church of Thyatira, and Jezebel was given room for repentance. She would not, and those that followed her, that they would enter that sick bed and they would be in great tribulation. Now, surprising as you study it this way concerning removing of the ancient landmarks, carry it through as I believe the, the Spirit just taught us. Verse 15, Moses describes the witness. So the idea of, of one who had killed by accident, they would have to get witnesses and inquire and find this out. One who had killed on purpose, they'd have to discover all this. What about this other option of somebody lying? A false witness. One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, verse 15. 
For any sin, and any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or the mouth of three witnesses shall every matter be established. Jezebel hired at least two witnesses, worthless men, men of Belial, sons of Satan, if you will, children of the devil, worthless men, they'd say, they'd say anything. False witnesses put Naboth to, on the testimony of two false witnesses. What should have happened? Those men should have been. That's, that's the law. Here it is the law. So this one that would rise up, a false witness rises up against a man to testify against him what is wrong. Then both the men between the controversy, they stand before the Lord, they go to the priests and the judges, where in those days the judges shall make diligent inquisition. And behold, if the witness is a false witness, testified falsely against his brother, but there's a commandment that says you shouldn't bear false witness. So everybody just follows that, right? You see how that in the writing of the law, the giving of the law, it has not improved righteousness. And in those days they were told this, you shall do unto him as he had thought to do unto his brother. Those two worthless men that Jezebel hired to steal, to move the boundaries, should have been killed. Now, roll back in the beginning of this study to chapter 11 of Revelation when God puts his two witnesses on the earth, bearing witness to the truth of God dwelling with mankind. Because in that temple is going to be a false Christ that all of mankind bows down to an image of him. And God simply is there to bear witness and say, that's not true. An incredible, simple, powerful witness that God gives his witness and the world kills those two and then God miraculously brings them up into heaven. And from that point forward, it is wrath unfurled in the last half of that seven-year time period. This is what's coming. Well, what do we learn from this? And then I miss verse 20. Those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no such more evil among you. Isn't that the truth of an open rebuke or someone sinning and you rebuke them and sin is addressed? If sin is addressed in a body of believers, everybody there is healthy, they fear the Lord, like, I, I, I got to get my own life. I got to turn away from sin. When, when we talk about this and we talk about all these things in our lives to be brought to righteousness, it's healthy. What do we learn? The false witness is guilty of the thing accused the other of doing. That's an important understanding. Well, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Well, who's my neighbor? Isn't that where this whole thing goes? And then we have all the New Testament describes this. My plea unto us with the understanding and teaching commandments of our Lord is we must preach Christ Jesus. There are so many false witnesses in the world. Where's the true witness? We sang today, Jesus is faithful and true. That's a quote of his witness to this world from the book of Revelation. He is faithful and true. We are bearing witness to the Son of God by how we go out and preach Christ. He's the only way. My plea with us to understand the teachings, commandments, this is the simple truth. We are witnesses of Him. We are witnesses unto Him. So I remind you, there are many false witnesses in the world. False Christ, false prophets, false shepherds, false teachers, false brethren, liars that tell you there are many ways to be saved, false angels, even this. I believe that Satan is the biggest fat liar and false witness that accuses the brethren day and night before the throne. Isn't that who he is? He will be judged. God sends one angel down when it's time to, to bind him up and put him in the pit for a thousand years. One angel lays hold of him, puts him in chains. To that. It's not like God's like worried about how he's going to capture Satan. Jesus defeated him at the cross. He's already defeated. There are so many false witnesses in the world right now. False systems. The, Satan is the biggest one of them and he's going to be able to put his false Christ, his false Messiah, the beast, together with the false prophet, making things look like miraculous signs from heaven. And do you think Deuteronomy 19 has anything to say to us about the refuge we need and have in Christ? Verse 21 says that I shall not pity, but... Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Righteousness. And what does Jesus teach? He teaches us the exceeding righteousness. And there's only one thing I know that exceeds that righteousness because we're always trying to figure out what's the intention of man, what's in ignorance, what happened, we need witnesses. And Jesus knows every single thing. Can you imagine that? Him walking the earth in his first coming, he knows all the sinfulness of mankind, of everyone that he's meeting. And what does he say? When, 
when asked by the two sons of thunder that he asked to follow him, and they said, well, they, these Samaritans, they're, they're not receiving us. We're going up to Jerusalem, not receiving us. Should we call down fire from heaven? He says, you don't know what spirit you are. The Son of Man did not come to, de to destroy those lives, but to save them. We just studied Acts 18 on Wednesday, how years later the Holy Spirit goes forth and saves Samaria. Do you understand? This isn't about going now from this point forward, righteousness and justice upon all the sinners of the world. We are still under preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ that the sinner may be saved. And as men increase their ungodliness, what should we do? Should we complain about their ungodliness? Should we be surprised? Should we say, should we say something like, oh, you're going to get yours? Or, or do we actually believe that we're witnesses of the death and resurrection through the gospel of Jesus Christ that all of mankind could be saved? We preach Christ. We've studied the teachings, right? We just did Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and now we come to the person. Right? If you're on the way fleeing to the city of refuge, do you, really want to, do you really want to inspect the plans of the city to see who planned the layout and make sure it's a good place to live? You just, you just gotta get there. I mean, do you know how many people deceivingly, I just, I just don't know enough about Jesus. They, all these things they make up, they say, you gotta get there. You need Jesus. And what's our job? Well, if the way, you know what the big fat liar, Satan, the accuser of the brethren, the false witness, you know what he does? When people are trying to flee to Jesus, you know what he does? Trips them up. He stumbles them. Right? He puts cares of this life in front of them. They get worried about this. And that's what he does. So my plea with you, how should we live? What's our application to get people to come to the person? Well, we live as the children of this promise of life. Live bought by the blood of Jesus. Live redeemed. Right? Do, we, do we then make, do we pretend we don't have a past? Do we, do we hide our current battle with temptation? No, we live openly, honestly, transparently. And I say we have three things that the Bible repeats under the new covenant over and over and over again. And if you put these three things into this promise of life, it will give you the endurance and stability that you need as the world around you is corrupting and it's rotting and it's stinking and you smell the flesh and the judgment and it stinks like the dead cow that's been out in the sun all week in the summer. I have a visual of that growing up on the farm when one of our livestock died that was too big for us to bury. My dad would call the rendering truck is what we called it. I didn't know what that meant growing up. I just knew that was the truck that would show up right, and take this bloated animal, be it a cow or a sow, that happened on the farm. And if it was a delay in them getting there because they had to pick up other dead, rotting flesh around the county, and they got to us after three or four days in the summer, and if it had been too long, that animal would split open and stink horribly, and you'd see all the maggots already at work in the corruption. And the smell, right? The only thing I can compare it to is a rotten potato if you've ever smelled a rotten potato. Now why do I do such things like that unto you to bring that up in that way? Why did you do that to us? I want you to be thoroughly convinced that the flesh does not please God. It's rotten and stinking and it might dress up nice on the outside and put it on TV for a time with fake beauty treatments and you're like, ooh, bodies and... It's rotten, stinking flesh that's not gonna survive this world. The only thing that survives out of this world is that which Jesus has saved. And he doesn't save your flesh. He saves your soul. See, we're witnesses of something, aren't we? So what are those three things to give us that endurance stability while the rest of the world is rotten and sticking all around us? Well, the way Paul said this to the church over and over, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. Now, my flesh is rotten through and through, but my soul is saved. The sins in the flesh, this body, of, this body of sin and death I carry around until the Lord comes and gets me, whether it be through death or through rapture, this body of sin is put off. I get a new body, one that can survive into the kingdom and then future of the eternity of God in the next stage. Now, if you just came into this, in the middle of this whole thing without understanding of any of the stuff I talked about, you'd say, those people are out of their mind in there. When Paul was being accused of out of his mind, he says, oh, quite the contrary, I'm in my right mind. 
for the first time these things that I did not know before that now I know. So you have a choice. You can go out and preach whatever you want to preach. You're a witness of something. If you want to go preach Christian liberty, good luck in getting anybody to heaven and, and like stumbling yourself over the, the rocks in the pathway of the city of refuge. You want to proclaim your liberties to a Christ-rejecting world, they're not going to respect you. But if you will tell them the truth. We had lesbians that come to church for a while and they, 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 they came to me and, and Tanya, we were talking with them and said, tell us the truth. Told them the truth. Said you need to repent. Just like I had to repent. See, if we believe Jesus came and died for the sin of the world and that he cleanses us from the sin of the world, then we have to repent of all those things that we were doing before and say, I, I follow Jesus, putting off all the things of the flesh. Now I remind you in this faith, hope, and love that you're not alone. And the way I'd say it to you is this, and I'll leave with this today. The moment you believe and receive Jesus Christ, right, James talks about the implanted word, that, that moment that that seed begins to sprout. When you believe and receive Jesus, you are born of him, that, that begins right there. Christ is formed in you. That's the beautiful mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Hear the word hope? Hope equals refuge. Right? Hope equals refuge. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. The moment that he's formed in you, that he's your hope. He doesn't stop there. He continues now to conform you through the Holy Spirit, even now, before you put off this body of flesh, he's conforming you into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So it goes kind of like this. Christ is formed in you, and now he's conforming you. And there's one final transformation that will take place. Oh, if you don't think the world doesn't know that they need a transformation, how many people right now are transitioning from one form to another in the flesh, thinking that if they, if they somehow they can get rid of this conflict, don't call it sin. I know, I know those that think they're, they're a man trapped in a woman's body and vice versa. The world is all confused and they are trying to transform themselves, reinvent themselves. They're trying to make everything legal through technology and all this stuff. They're saying we will transform ourselves. There's only, that, that, that's a lie. That's part of the, that false witness of Satan to lie to somebody that way. Now as I impart this to you, our transformation begins here. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove with that, what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God. Our witness that we have been saved as Christ is formed in us. We're conformed not to this world, but we're conformed in Jesus Christ. And one day, one day in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trump of God, transformed transformed now, how do you want to meet him you want to meet him as the avenger for your sins and ignorance or do you want to receive Jesus and look forward to transformation transformed from this lowly body of flesh and sin and death who hasn't been angry to kill somebody in this world right, you see why this whole refuge I have found the way to the city of refuge. I have found the way to Jesus, our refuge. I'm looking for that transformation. 1 Corinthians 15 describes a new body, a spiritual body. What are those bodies going to be like? It'll be like Jesus, transformed. I have nothing to transition unto in this world. I'm already saved from sin and death. I've already agreed with God that my flesh must die and that the spirit of life must live in me. I've been baptized openly, publicly in agreement of the testimony of Jesus, died, died with Christ to sin, alive to God, continuing in him. And now I'm an ambassador. Showing others the way to the city of refuge, which God provides. You ready to preach Christ this, this Saturday to Jamestown? Repentance. You just, you, you preach Christ, convince people, stop living as if the Son of God hasn't come, because he has come. See, how can we witness a lie that says, well, it doesn't matter how you live. No, it matters in every way that if you've received Jesus, you follow Jesus. If the Son of God has bought you, then you belong to him. He's our inheritance. So, 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you, Jesus, are our city of refuge. We sit before you, Lord, and ask for your Holy Spirit to come upon us in the same way that you came upon the early church with the promise that, that you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Lord, we want to be those people that the Holy Spirit would come upon us in that same way to be witnesses unto you, Lord Jesus. Witnesses unto you in our Jerusalem, our Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world, including Valley City, Jamestown, Fargo, Wapaton, and other places in the world. In Jesus' name, amen.